<sighs> well, guess what? You waited long enough, very patiently. Thanks for doing that. Pop update! Yay! I know. I know. No excuses, right? But seriously, I have been busy. <sighs> but it's time. I'm going to try to keep this a 30 minute video. I got a lot to share with you. This is a PAP update number 24. Now, what I have to share with you today is important as I need your feedback. Um, this is an interaction between you, me, and the PAP experiment. Okay, that's what it's about. Teamwork, thinking together, doing together. That's what it's about. So this is your opportunity to, to get some serious input on what's going to be happening. This video, I get to finally tell you the very important and cool, awesome thing about the PAP update. And actually for future projects, it's very fantastic. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. First of all, I just want to say thank you for your support. Really, I mean it. And if you did not know this, um, there is a conference coming up. It's called the um, Global BEM, um, Global Breakthrough Energy Movement. And there's a conference in Boulder, Colorado. I was invited to speak, grateful for that. And hopefully I can meet some people there and just enlighten this whole subject and all the other subjects that I've been researching on in the past. So please do check the description. I'll have a link down there. It's October 11th, 12th, oh, 10th, 11th, and 12th. So check the description and make sure you check that out and try to support these people. They're doing an amazing thing trying to get people in their garage such as me and people that have high educations in the same conference. It's amazing. So just go check that out. That's one thing I needed to tell you guys. Besides that, I will be paying more attention to the popper thread on my forums. I've actually been uh, very um, distant from my forums lately. I just haven't had the time. So uh, to be informative, anything in this video I talk about, please go to the forums, the description. It'll have the link. Check it out. Go there and post your information. But I do need your feedback in this video. I'm going to quickly talk about some stuff I've been doing. I have been playing with this device, popping stuff, you know, gases of all different kinds, and trying some different capacitors, different distances on my spark gap, all sorts of stuff. I don't even remember where we left off, so I'm kind of refreshing even myself. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, Lately, I haven't been receiving the same amount of pop and force action out of the popper device you see here. And I don't know why that is, but um, I think it has something to do with, originally I was using hydrogen, and then I switched to helium only, just because it's a little less dangerous, a little bit easier to fill up, and I don't have to waste as much gas, because when I do the hydrogen, I purge it a bunch of, side, bunch of times to get all that stuff going, and make sure there's no oxygen in there. Um, and I don't like using the hydrogen because there's some sort of a chemical reaction going on and it kind of turns the inside of this thing a little bit black and this and that. So I've been trying to stick to the inert gases, just helium right now, and uh, I, the result's a little bit different and I'm not quite sure. I need to do some more studying. I think it has a lot to do with the spark gap distance inside this chamber. I think it has a lot to do with that. But let me show you what I've got here. All right. Again, the first part of this video going to be a little slow, kind of a refresher, just talking about what I've been doing. And then the second part of this video is where I really need you guys to focus in, pay attention, and give me your feedback. Um, you're welcome to voice your opinion. All right, here's the deal. I originally started with these two capacitors right here. Then I switched to everything I could find laying around that was high enough voltage and big enough capacitance to work. This particular bank of capacitors did some amazing stuff. This got us through the first session. Then I decided to build a bank like this. Okay. Now for some reason when I switched from this bank to this bank and it could have something to do with the spark gap it just didn't seem to react the same. Um, it could be the gases. There's a lots of different things. I honestly don't know yet but I'm just informing you it's been kind of weird. So I don't know what's going on just yet. But 
a lot of people have been asking me to try to go ahead and use higher voltage capacitors, which I want to. Um, unfortunately, I didn't really have any on hand. So, moving from these capacitors, doing more tests with these capacitors. Alright, let me show you what these are. Alright, 500 microfarads at 1440 volts DC. Now, I can tell you I've only charged these to the same voltage as what those are, which is a lot less joules. But, I can already tell you that when this goes bang, this goes bang. It's fast. That's what I'm looking for. We want the reaction to be really fast. Originally, I thought if I could build a bank and just use a high amount of current and keep the voltage up in this bank, that we could make the pulse fast enough to kind of act like this but have a big storage and that way you don't have to completely replenish the entire pack. So that was kind of my theory and idea behind using a pack like that, which I, I it's still open. I still haven't got the circuitry just yet to really do what I want. So a lot of you have been asking me to do this. Now I did have to drop a little money on these. These weren't cheap, but they did come off eBay and they were a lot cheaper than you can uh, probably find them anywhere else. These are custom made which is kind of a problem. If you look this company up, they custom make capacitors. These are actually custom made. Um, and they do have teeny tiny little leads coming off of them, but supposedly they are used as um, high discharge capacitors, even though they've got these teeny leads coming off of them. Since it's a high voltage, low capacitance, that's okay. I've got the uh, little jumpers tied together like this. So you're only pulling what one capacitor can handle through a single wire, and everything's tied in uh, parallel here. So I've got eight, eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, eight, because that's all I really wanted to spend. Because they, um, I've got them on eBay. I think they were twenty dollars a piece, if I remember. So not real expensive, but still slightly pricey. But it's the only way to find out if this type of capacitor is going to work. It's all that I had. The other capacitors I had, which I got to thank Blaine for sending these. Blaine has been a blessing to me. Thank you, Blaine, for everything you've sent me. Um, these are 0.4 microfarads at 5,000 volts DC. So these two little capacitors, believe it or not, is over. Uh, so if I remember the calculations right, 5,000 joules of energy. All right, just these two. This is 5,000, okay? And that bank right there, you see, okay? These don't fall off and break. That whole bank that you see right there, double wide, is 10,000. So a single row of these is the same as these two. Now, I do not think these are rapid discharge capacitors, so you may not be able to do that to these. You might damage them. Um, the other thing is I don't have a 5,000 volt DC power supply that will rapidly charge these. Um, I do have this 10,000 volt DC power supply. I actually have two of these Blaine sent me. And I'm using this, or will be, to charge these capacitors. I actually haven't tested these. I've only tested these, but I've only done that on the old circuit. Okay, so I haven't done anything with a higher voltage than about 700 volts. Because I don't have anything set up yet. I do have this microwave transformer that I'll be using to charge these capacitors um, and I should be able to rapidly charge these capacitors you know for a minute or two without overheating anything I really don't know what the rate of charge and discharge are on these capacitors but you know I wanted to try a very high voltage very fast discharge capacitor so in theory one of these will do the job okay because I know for for all the testing I've done around a thousand joules is a good place to start I can easily get 250 uh, 2500 joules out of this little capacitor granted I don't know what it will handle um, being high voltage it's got smaller leads that's the way it works but I might blow one of these leads right off here and it'd be shot I don't know this says Filtron not 100% sure. I'm going to guess this is a filter capacitor uh, for a radio or something. So this is not the type of capacitor for high discharge. Okay. So anyway, um, 
that's kind of where I wanted to go. I wanted to test the high voltage side of things. I know a lot of people have been wanting me to do that. I've been wanting to do that. I just didn't have the capacitors. So now I do. Now we'll be charging them up to maximum potential and trying this thing out. And uh, I did some filming in the past and I just didn't publish anything. Um, so I'll probably end up refilming stuff and publishing new stuff in the, in the future here. Now, um, just for reference, I will be going to this conference and I'll be focusing a lot or almost all of my time on that, preparing for that. So you won't see a whole lot in the future here. It'll be, be down the road a month or so. But just to let you know kind of where I'm going, um, the coils, now that I've got the circuitry um, on the PLC, I'll be able to hook up the coils and do timing on the coils. Now, um, oh, really quickly, I did uh, did get a new transformer. Check this bad boy out. 3 kVA, 240, 480, or 120 to 240. It's the exact same thing as this, except this is a 750 um, volt amps, um, and this is 3,000. This is a very cool transformer. Look at the size, the size comparison of these things. This actually came out of a substation. Um, it was the part that does the metering and some of the uh, internal circuitry. Pretty sweet. I also did get this pretty cool amp meter, 3,000 amps. And I've got a couple of uh, transducers up here, which will be extremely handy. There's a, uh, check this thing out. I can't lift it with one hand hardly. There's another one back here. This is a 3,200 3, amp transducer. So these, I'm going to set this down here. These will come in handy for different tests. Um, because what I'm about to tell you, I'm going to need some of this equipment. So here's the deal. I'm going to explain to you why I need your feedback. I hope I explained all this well enough. Just get you an idea of what I'm thinking. Um, I can't guarantee anything. I really don't like talking about the future when I haven't done it yet. But I gotta gotta give you guys some information as much as I possibly can. So that's what I'm doing. Now it's time to listen. This is kind of part two of this video. This is where I need your input. Um, a guy by the name of Tim Alls. A lot of people were asking who Tim was, and I still haven't told everybody. Tim Alls has. A business where he deals with um, national instruments. He uses LabVIEW to record everything for what he does and he builds the system, he has the licenses, he is awesome. Okay, Tim has built a entire system that runs on national instruments LabVIEW and this is the data acquisition module. It's kind of dark over here. I need some light bulbs. This is the data acquisition module. Alright, this is a 8 input, 12 bit. Uh, it's 10,000 samples a second. Analog and digital. And uh, basically what we're going to be doing is using National Instruments Lab View with that um, DAC recorder along with the PLC system that I've shown you in the past all working in junction together to do data recording with pressure transducers, voltage transducers, current transducers and try to actually get data on this device. Now obviously we know that it's probably not going to be very high in efficiency. Point being we gotta start somewhere so this is where we're starting. My problem with this whole experiment is I can make a minute change. How am I supposed to see it? How am I supposed to tell? I can't. I just, I just can't. You can't just look at this thing and go, oh, that, that made a difference, unless it's dramatic. And, you know, if that happens, then I really need to pay attention to what happened. But, unfortunately, nothing dramatic has happened. It's been pretty well the same. You get a certain amount of energy in for a certain amount of energy out, and it's definitely not nowhere near, you know, probably even 50% efficient. It's probably way lower than that. But the point is, is the process itself is something worth pursuing, looking into, and understanding. So with that being said, you guys get a chance to actually input what you want to see on the National Instruments Lab View. Now let me show you what we've got. What I need your help with actually is to 
inform me what kind of, um, uh, what do you call it, a report. What kind of data and information do you want on the report? Okay, that's what. That's why I'm asking you guys to watch this video, and I need your feedback because you guys are going to help make the data. That's what. That's what this is all about. So I'm going to try to do this, and it's probably going to be terrible because I'm going to be holding the camera. But I'm going to. I'm going to do my best here. So just bear with me. Um. So first of all, this is the kind of information that we'll be putting in here. Right now, um, we can do up to eight channels of different I.O. inputs, and the setup page here is going to give us our test information, what I've done, what I've got set up, how I've got it, you know, space in the, um, the gap in the, the, uh, the arc, um, distance gap, all, all that kind of stuff I can put in here. Now, we've got more stuff to add here, and that comes back to your guys' input. The chart reports is here and basically what it does is it allows me to go back and load data, data, load data, alright, and go back and view it and actually zoom in and look at stuff and see what happened and watch the current and watch the voltage. Um, this ain't this ain't fast, 10,000 samples a second if you're using a single channel. Every time you add a channel it divides by two I believe or, or half. But uh, that might not be totally correct, but it kind of, you, you got to be limited. So if we do four things, we can still get, uh, what is that, 250, yeah, 2,500 samples a second. That's pretty darn fast. It should be enough to see what we want to see. So here's the deal. Um, the charts, okay, in the report, this program, Tim, is actually licensed to distribute the runtime program. You will have to go to La National Instruments and download the runtime, but then we can give you this application and you can reload the data. We're going to try to load it to a server and you guys can pull that data directly from the server, even live. The, the, the fact that we can write directly to a server and you guys can literally watch on the live shows and watch the data and help me analyze it. That is the whole entire reason and the whole thing that I've always been trying to do is what I would consider live open science. So really quickly, I'm going to kind of go through what we've got so far. We've got the oscilloscope. You go in here and you pick your channel. You pick your minimum, maximum, um, your samples per channel and the rate. Uh, if I hit run, it should go. Yeah. All right, so this is live data coming in. Now there's nothing connected to the channel, so the amplitude is uh, um, 0 0.1 to 0.6. Yeah, about five, increment of five or so, six, eight maybe. Now if I stop it, and now I can save it. I can actually save this file, and. Uh, each time we do something we've got different channels here you can I haven't messed with this a whole lot but you can zoom in on a channel you can see the data um, you can go over here and pick all the different types of plots the different timings let me kind of just zoom in here I'm kind of far out and kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about so over here I can plot everything do my times channels and literally add in all sorts of uh, information that I want to do. Now this is the data recording part of the system. We also have integrated, Tim has integrated a PLC timing configuration and I asked him to lay it out like this so we can visually see what happens. So a charge time, a stop, a dead zone, a fire, a, a turn on coil one, at this point and right now we've just got it so you can just kind of see the visual um, we've got multiple high voltage firings so that we can do multiple firings on a single discharge so forth and so on and uh, this this is kind of not labeled 100 percent the way I would label it but you get the idea of the different type of inputs that we've got here okay you can interpolate the different things that are going on here um, so basically I can uh, I can read exactly directly from the PLC 
Okay, so I had, I cut the video to show you that I didn't know what I was doing because I had the wrong COM port selected. So here's the deal. Um, I'm going to actually go through this real quick and show you how this works. So I'm going to go up here to total cycle time. We're just going to put 500. That's uh, milliseconds. So that's, I believe, 500 seconds. Then we're going to go with coil 2 is going to be off. Sorry about the crappy footage. Coil 1 is going to be on from uh, let's say uh, 250 to 300. Let's say the radio is going to turn on before that. We'll say, uh, we'll say 200 to 2 50 um, the rush which is the discharge um, we'll turn it on right at uh, 255 and turn it off at 257 now we're going to charge from 10 on up to 190 spare off high voltage is going to be um, from 225 to 250 uh, let's see let's go up with that let's go from 250 to 260 and we're going to set all the other high voltage discharges to zero sorry if I'm missing the footage I've zoomed in so that you can see it this is probably extremely shaky footage my apologies but I don't have a table close enough to hold the camera okay now let me back out now I've got all the parameters filled and I'm going to actually go up here and hit write to PLC and it just wrote that exact timing to the PLC and I get a visual chart so each one of these is represents a different thing so the charge time is here then we that's the spare then the rush or the high voltage uh, discharge the capacitance is right there uh, actually this is the high voltage yeah anyway charge high voltage discharge um, I got the pink as a spare the green is coil one so the coils on at this time you get the idea and then over here is actually it writes those numbers and values now I can actually save and reload this so if I save uh, this as T Boom. Okay, let's say I want to load one. Load saved timing. Then I hit right. And voila. Now I've just wrote in the program. So what I can do is set up predetermined tests and do exactly what I want. Um, and uh, do different tests with different things. And I actually was writing that directly to the PLC. So if I flip this switch, all right those lights indicate the outputs that's this program right here um, so let's go ahead and load the one I just made earlier write it to the PLC and voila now we've got that one in the program so you can see what happens to our outputs now Okay, you get the point. So basically what that allows us to do is uh, set up particular tests and go back to them and have the exact same scenarios and do different things and it's just a fantastic idea. Now here's the thing, if there's anything you've seen that you would like to see different, let me know. Because all you have to do is go buy this PLC, download the program which we are going to give away for free, because that's how it works with open source. 
And you'll have to get the runtime yourself. He can't distribute the runtime, but he can distribute the actual program that he built. He's got a license for that. So he can actually give you this program. We can give you the program. You can play with this on your own. You can build your own system and use exactly what we have here. You can replicate everything. And it's stuff that you can go purchase instead of trying to build something from scratch. Um, so load save data. I don't think I have anything. Uh, we'll try this and probably crash it. I don't know if I got anything. But anyway, this allows you to reload data and look at it. You'll actually be able to go back and look at all the recorded data. And then again, we'll have a report. And the report is the most important part that I need your feedback from. So, that gives you an idea um, of exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get actual data. Now I got a, one more thing to show you here. This circuit board, which I will post the schematics over at in the forums, is um, the actual safety circuit. This is actually the I.O. board that I've created that will be tying into the data acquisition module right here. Basically this is a safety. This has 20 volt Zener diodes and a um, 100 to 1 um, step down, 100 to 1 voltage divider and then we have these diodes here which protect this unit. Now this unit has internal protection but we're dealing with some nasty stuff. I haven't quite tested everything and I'm not quite sure it's going to work perfect because of all the RF. I might have to bury all this stuff in a Faraday cage and keep it away from all this. You've seen what happened to my other pressure transducer when it was just close to the system. So I've got to be very careful. This is a new one. He sent me another one. He had a spare and he sent me that and so I'll be able to actually try to run that away from there through a hydraulic line or something. I haven't determined exactly what I'm going to do yet. Anyway, this is the exciting news I've been wanting to tell you guys, and I just I just haven't had time. Um, I've been taking care of a lot of life things. I'm not going to tell you everything I've done because there's too many even the name, but one of them was paint the entire outside of the house. Actually, my wife and my dad painted most of it. I watched the kids, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So anyway, life stuff happening. Um, be sure to check out the awesome globalbem.com conference that's going to be happening that is awesome and uh, if I look tired it's because I am sacrificing some time tonight I do also have some radioactive materials that I'll be playing with uh, this is americium out of a uh, actually it says right here out of a fire uh, fire uh, alarm this is two micro curies of americium 241. It's the only radioactive material I can get a hold of. But here's the deal. You see this little bitty flake? See that little bitty flake in there? Look at the size difference. See the size difference? And I know it's a little bit farther away, but that's literally the size difference. Um, this came out of a really, really, really old um, detector, and it has a lot. So what I'd like to do is, since this is an alpha admitter, hopefully it'll give us the similar results. I want to just get this very close to the arc and use it as, as is. Other ideas that I've been pondering. So that's it. This has been uh, Russ, rwgresearch.com. I'm going to be actually doing a live show right now. I should be live right now. I'm probably going to be in trouble for being late. Late. And uh, I'm going to try to hook up the high voltage and run it. Don't know if there'll be a video of all that stuff, but the live feed will be on RWG Research. Oh no, YouTube.com forward slash RWG Research Live. Okay, RWG Research L I V E. That is the place where I post all my live footage. Um, Hexar, thank you for uploading the footage. He grabs the stream and uploads it. Uploads it. Uploads it to YouTube. All right, peace and love to you guys. I'm going to try to stay awake the rest of the night and get some stuff done. So please, leave your feedback over at the forums. I appreciate everybody, and I greatly appreciate you guys being patient with me. Um, yeah, that's all I got. There's just a lot of stuff going on. Peace and love to you guys. Have a good day. Bye. Whee.
Yeah.